So um, first of all, thank you all for uh, joining uh, West Midlands SIBZ um, latest um, CPD presentation. Um, certificates uh, for one hour duration will be automatically issued uh, via Ella at uh, HQ. Um, today um, our presentation is on the NEC4 uh, form of contract top tips. Uh, it's been undertaken by Geraldine Fleming who I'll let introduce herself when she, she comes on board. Geraldine uh, has previously done presentations for West Midlands um, which I believe was NEC3 which was well received and hence um, a favourite a favorite person that we always like to invite back so uh, thank, thank you Geraldine and I'm going to hand over to you. Brilliant, thank you very much Martin. Um, delighted to be here, so thank you very much to Sibsi for the invitation to, I'm going to say nicely, torture some of your members on today's session. Um, I have got a, a full set of PowerPoint notes to go through. Um, I am delighted to have questions as we go through. If you could type them into the chat and if I see them as we're going through, then of course I will stop the presentation and answer the questions. Um, if I miss any, uh, fingers crossed there will be uh, time to actually answer a couple of questions at the end as well. Um, I, I am going to be sending a copy of the presentation across to SIPSI so that they will have the presentation as well um, along with this recording. Uh, if you did actually want to listen to it twice, um, I think you're a special type of person. So here we go, uh, NEC4 and top tips. Um, the first couple of slides just explains a little bit about the organisation that I work for. So essentially I work for Driver Tret and we work across the engineering and construction industries. It's very rare that in my line of business I get to put pretty pictures on uh, PowerPoint slides. So obviously I take every opportunity to get some colour on there. Um, we are a market leader in expert witness, planning, commercial, technical. Importantly, and I really do want to emphasise this, today's session for me is about dispute avoidance. So in other words, that people who are listening into the session today actually realise the, uh, the good bits and the bad bits about NEC4 and adapt their behaviour to suit. Um, obviously things do go wrong on construction projects, unfortunately a little bit too regularly, and we do get involved in dispute, dispute resolution as well. Established in 19, 1978, we are stock market listed with over 300 staff working worldwide. Some of you may pick up that I haven't got the most West Midlands accent ever. Um, you might be absolutely thinking that it's a pure Liverpool accent and I think the further away I go from my hometown, uh, the stronger my accent sounds. Um, it, it is actually an Ellesmere Port accent, obviously famous for an oil refinery. Um, we do have offices all around the UK and your local office uh, in terms of the West Midlands is probably Coventry, but we might just sneak in there for a couple of you who are at the top of the uh, West Midlands region for the Hooton Cheshire office, which is my local office. Uh, three main parts of the business. Driver project services, essentially we provide people onto live construction projects. So project managers, QSs and planners. I work for Driver Tret and I like to describe my role as a cradle to grave service. So looking at contracts before organisations actually sign up to them, providing advice during a live project as well as helping out at the end. And my planning and delay analysis colleagues do exactly the same thing. The right hand side there you can see Dialis which is our expert witness division and we have experts in quantum delay and importantly also on the technical side as well. In addition we have adjudicators, arbitrators and mediators that work within the business. Um, obviously, a, a aim of today is definitely to give you a bit of inspiration and to do some further reading around the topic areas. Um, we do produce a twice yearly digest, which in my view has some quite interesting legal contractual related articles. Um, if you are very, very modern and good with IT, you can do that funny QR thing with the camera or you can just go to our website or email our marketing department. 
Finally, in terms of an introduction, it's normally nice to give you a little bit of information about me. Um, I do know that a few on the session today are quantity surveyors, so a particular thanks to you guys for coming along. Um, yes, I'm also a quantity surveyor, um, chartered. Um, I'm ex-main uh, contractor, so I worked for Balfour BT for five years as a site quantity surveyor. Um, went on and completed a law degree part time and also my solicitor's exams, but made a conscious decision not to go and qualify as a solicitor because I really enjoy what I do uh, at the moment at Driver Trek, uh, which is essentially rolling my sleeves up and helping people on the coalface with their contractual issues. Uh, I have worked in construction claims consultancy for over 20 years and I am never going to change that line because obviously people will be able to guess my age too accurately. So um, I did initially think I was going to call this talk 10 top tips and then I couldn't decide which one I was going to drop. So it's just top tips and I am actually covering 11 items. It would be extraordinarily boring to read those out particularly in an hour's presentation. So I will just get on with the show. Number one, my first tip is absolutely that you must know what option of NEC you are on and importantly, make sure you choose one. Now, in terms of the options, of course, Martin has already mentioned that previously I had done a talk on NEC 3, but today is about NEC 4. So the starting point is, are you on an NEC 3 contract or are you on an NEC 4? If you are on an NEC 4, then which version is it? The NEC 4 was originally published in June 2017. And we've had two sets of amendments that have come out since the January 19 set and the October 2020 set. The amendments are available for free from the NEC website and you absolutely need to know which version that you're working on. But not only is it which NEC, NEC 3, NEC 4 and which set of amendments, but taking that further, I also want you to know which of the main options you are on. I've written there the six options that are available, which are lettered A to F. So option A, price contract with activity schedule. B, price contract bill of quantities. C, target contract with activity schedule. And D, target contract with bill of quantities. E is a cost reimbursable and F is a management contract. Now I have specifically highlighted two. So option A, the price contract with activity schedule and C, the target contract with activity schedule. I personally think that these are quite badly described. And if I was actually giving them a title, I would describe option A as a lump sum milestone contract. I think price contract with activity schedule doesn't really um, hit you clearly enough what it is you are entering into. So option A, essentially, if there are no variations or claims, the contract is a lump sum contract. In other words, you are agreeing to a certain amount of work for a fixed pot of money. That's where the lump sum bit comes in. I've also used the word milestone because essentially the contractor will be paid on a milestone basis. So if you have a contract, let's say that's worth £100,000 and there are five milestones each of 20000 you won't be able to be paid for any of those milestones until you have completed the milestone in full. I sounded a bit like Martin Lewis what there with his rules about paying your credit card off in full. And a similar thing here with the NEC that you don't get the milestone until it is 100% complete. So certainly if I'm reviewing an NEC 4 or an NEC 3 actually on this point in terms of it being a milestone or activity schedule type contract, 
and I'm looking at cash flow, I want the contractor to have lots and lots of milestones to get the best cash flow possible. Of course, if I'm working on the employer's side, I'm happy when I see only a few milestones because that means that the employer's cash flow will be better. The other, uh, I'm going to say second most likely uh, option that you would enter into would be an NEC option C. Now the phraseology does look similar, target contract with activity schedule, but it is an entirely different way of actually procuring the works. And um, I've described it there in the yellow box as a cost reimbursable with a twist. So cost reimbursable meaning that the contractor is paid what the contractor spends and the twist is nothing to do with gin and tonic or lemon and lime. The twist of course comes from the fact that there is a pain gain mechanism in the contract. Again to try and give you an easy example of this let's say that the target was set at £100. The contractor completes the scope of work and actually only spends 80. The contractor has come underneath the target and if it was a 50-50 pain gain mechanism, whilst the contractor has only spent 80, the contractor would be in reimbursed 90 pounds, that being half the difference between the 80 and the 100. Equally, if the contractor went on and spent £120, there would be another twist that went on. Unfortunately for the contractor, that would be a pain twist. Despite the contractor having spent £120 on the project, they would only be reimbursed £110. Again, that be, being equidistant between the 100 and the 120. So do keep in mind the difference, the huge difference in my opinion, between an option A and an option C and lump sum milestone versus cost reimbursable plus a twist, I think is the best way of remembering the difference between those two. One top tip down, 10 to go. The second one, it of course relates to the secondary options and there are a huge number of secondary options to go through and um, the way I've highlighted this on the screen is anything that's in black and underlined and in bold text they're the things that are new against NEC3. Anything in red are actually are the things from a contractor's perspective that I would want the contractor to include. As we go through these uh, uh, list 21 on the, on the list that we're going to go through, um, just think to yourself, if you're the employer, would you want this option in or out? Or if you're the contractor, would you want the option in or out? Um, I'm sure that everybody on the session today is absolutely aware of the uh, increase in material prices and also the longer lead in times that we're facing on projects. Having said that, I will admit at this point that I have never seen option X1 chosen. So in other words, the price adjustment for inflation. Um, do I think that that's going to form more of a talking point going forward? Yes, I absolutely do. Um, do I think employers are going to want to see X1 chosen? No, because of course employers want to see cost certainty on their projects. So X1 is definitely a black and white or marmite issue between the parties. Equally X2, and this is one that I do think the parties really do need to address their minds to. Um, X2 is all about changes in the law. Um, of course, changes in the law could include things like Brexit, uh, the living wage, um, building regulations, and I'm thinking there particularly of Grenfell at the moment. Um, and that's of course without mentioning COVID and other things that we might see going forward. Again, if I'm the contractor, I do want changes in the law to be chosen because that means that I can claim more money if there are changes during the currency of the project. Again, if I'm the client, I don't want to see changes in the law because it will affect the certainty on the price. X3 is common 
between NEC3 and NEC4. Um, as a very selfish quantity surveyor, multiple currencies just quite frankly gives me a very large headache. But I do think from a contractor's perspective, that can help with hedging the currency risk. Again, employers tend not to like multiple currencies, quite simply because it means, again, less cost certainty. X4 did exist in NEC3, but it was called a parent company guarantee. The terminology has been updated for X4, and it's now called the ultimate holding company guarantee. And um, this is particularly interesting for um, contractors who have several layers to their organization. And so it might be that a particular main contractor it actually is four steps before you get up to the top of the tree in the organization. And X4 makes it clear that the parent company guarantee has to come from the top of the tree. Again, for me, that's a very client or employer biased clause. And normally most main contractors don't want the ultimate holding company to give the guarantee out. No changes at all with X5 and X6, but of course both are important from a risk management position. Um, do make sure that you know whether there is an X5 on sectional completion, so you have to hand the work back in sections as a contractor. X6 normally uh, happens on um, process environments, so water treatment works, etc. Where the contractor receives a bonus for finishing early. Uh, it used to happen in what I'll call the olden days on lane rental contracts on motorways. Again, there's no change on X7 under the contract. X7 is called delay damages. Um, despite the fact that we have had two decades of the NEC contracts from NEC2, NEC3 up to NEC4 now, um, I still stutter saying this and no doubt I go back to saying liquidated damages. We are going to look at that in a little bit more detail um, on one of my other top tips. So that will be revisited. The next four are all new. X8 is undertakings, which actually we would call collateral warranties. They've called it undertakings because NEC is absolutely trying to appeal to the international market and collateral warranties is a peculiar term to the UK. So really there's no change um, here between undertakings and collateral warranties, but this is a brand new secondary option. X9 covers copyright. X10, uh, of course, we would all know that as BIM. And X11 is a new one and I think bad news for contractors because it allows the client to terminate at will. So in other words, effectively on a whim. Over the page, and you can see another new one, but this is just a retitling. Uh, this is multi-party collaboration. Um, it used to be the partnering option. X13, no change, whether there's a requirement for a performance bond. X14 is all about um, advanced payment, and that should say advanced payment to the contractor in that particular one. X15 on the contractor's design. Again, that's another one of my separate top tips, which we are going to go through in a few minutes time. I've highlighted that one in red and it's also underlined. So this is slightly unusual, a, such an important one anyway. And there has been an important update as well. I like the fact here, and this definitely comes from my contractor bias, that retention is an optional clause. Uh, however, I will say it is normally chosen. No change here at all between NEC3 and NEC4. Low performance damages again remains as it was under NEC3. Again, I normally see that in water treatment works and factory or process environments. Limitation of liability is another important issue, again, for contractors and subcontractors. And I do have a few slides in this particular section. For some unknown reason, there is no X19 option 
I don't know why, whether they're going to possibly use that number going forward. There is an X20 on key performance indicators. Again, no change between NEC3 and NEC4. There are two brand new options. X21 on whole life costing, and this allows the parties to actually make changes because they've realized that in terms of the whole life of the project, there are good things that they can do to reduce the whole life of the project. Personally, I don't think this was particularly needed because of course the contractor could always have come up with proposals anyway um, under the NEC3 contract. Finally, another possibly white elephant clause, one that I don't think would be used, is X22 on early contractor involvement. Uh, my view is that the industry will stick with PCSAs. So in other words, um, pre-construction services agreement, rather than putting in a full NEC contract at an early point. Right, so let's just jump back very quickly and look at X18 on the limitation of liability issue. Remember again that all of these X uh, clauses are options and for them to bite, they have to be chosen by the parties. X18 is good news for a contractor, but bad news for the client because essentially what it does is it limits the client's liability. And um, I'm just going to pick on two of these, but all of them are important. Um, I'll pick on the first one, which is um, X18.2, which says the contractor's liability to the client for the client's indirect or consequential loss is limited to the amount stated in the contract data. If I go to the next slide, you can see there an extract from the contract data and a figure would be inserted there for limiting the contractor's liability on that particular point. Quite often when this option is chosen, I would see that limited to nil. And of course, it is only indirect or consequential loss and not to the direct losses, which are covered under the next item. The only other one I've got time to cover today is actually X18.6, the very last item. The contractor is not liable to the client for a matter unless details of the matter are notified to the contractor before the end of liability date. And again, if I jump back to the contract data, you can see the last line there says, the end of liability date is X years after completion of the whole of the works. Normally, if it's a simple contract, that would be completed with six years. If it's a deed or a contract under seal, that would be 12 years. Now, just in case any of you are working in Scotland, it wouldn't be six and 12, it would be five and 10 up there. But this clause actually allows people to put in maybe three years or 15 years instead in that particular clause. So again, watch out for this limitation of liability, whether you're a client, client's representative, or you're working for a contractor or indeed a subcontractor. Two down, a few more to go. Um, the next item I want to cover very briefly are communications. Um, even when I was doing this under NEC3, I would have covered this item, but there has been a significant update under NEC4. Essentially, NEC4 has updated itself for the digital superhighway. We can see there, first of all, 13.1 says, and it's a cut down version of what we had before. It says, each communication which the contract requires it's communicated in a form which can be read, copied and recorded. Writing is in the language of the contract. Now we'll stop at that point and look at read, copied and recorded before we move along to 13.2. So read, copied and recorded. Letters, yes, I'd probably say so. Faxes, 
OK, I'm probably showing my age, but yes, I think faxes would still be covered there. Emails, yes. Text messages, well, probably from here and downwards, I'm starting to feel a little bit more uncomfortable. But yes, text messages can be read and copied and recorded. Um, some kind of intranet system or document management system. Yes, again, it meets the criteria. Again, I'm moving into a more uncomfortable area with WhatsApp, um, which I do use, particularly for arranging my social visits to the pub. Um, Instagram, um, I tend not to use that, but I do look at it every now and again. Snapchat, absolutely not gone there. Obviously, I'm too old. And Facebook, in particular, Facebook Messenger, possibly I dabble in that now and again. But for those last four, the only one I've ever used on a work basis has been WhatsApp and only because it's very good for doing um, calls with more than one person. Um, so that I have used that from a work context. My advice to you guys, absolutely stay away from WhatsApp, Instagram, Snapchat and Facebook. The last one, verbal communications. Well, actually, verbal communications are quite interesting when we're looking at the situation on read, copied and recorded. Um, because, of course, I am communicating with all of you guys now verbally. Can this be read, copied and recorded? Yes to the copied and recorded bit, but the red bit, um, yes, some quite clever guy did once say to me, well, what about lip reading? Um, no, I am not having that. Verbal communications, no, the intention of NEC is absolutely not to allow verbal communications. Moving on to 13.2, which I've re-quoted here. Uh, the English is not brilliant or straightforward uh, in this particular clause. So I am going to read this slowly. It says, if the scope, now remembering here, the scope means the works information or the drawings and specification. If the scope specifies the use of a communication system, a communication has effect when it is communicated through the communication system specified in the scope. Yes, I want to hold my head in my hands at that drafting. So if the scope contains a communication system, that is permitted. OK. If the scope does not specify a communication system, we're back to the rules under NEC 3. A communication has effect when it is received at the last address notified by the recipient for receiving communications or if none is notified at the address of the recipient um, stated in the contract data. Now, there has been an update in the contract data at this point. It gives you an address, a postal address, as well as an electronic address. So overall, I think this is good, but you have to bespoke your contracts for it. You have to decide at an early point whether you are going to have a document management system and have a manual as to how the document management system will work. As a simple example, do you want termination notices being sent through the communication system or would you still want those being sent by recorded delivery? Alternatively, if you do want emails to be used, you need to fill the contract data out properly. We still have the same questions. What if the letter gets lost in the post? Well, it does say here um, we're looking at the address um, when it's received at the address. So under NEC, actually, a communication is only effective when it's received. So I would always advise that double bubbling of send it by email and also back it up with post. Emails I do think are valid, but only if the contract data has been completed properly. Documents given by hand, mm, uh, yeah, I have a doubt over those. Certainly it's not going to come into the first paragraph there of the communication system. And quite often the addresses are the formal office addresses of the parties and a progress meeting is quite often held on site. So I have a difficulty with that last item. 
The only other thing I want to say in this section about communications is 13.7, a really important clause in the contract. It says a notification or certificate which the contract requires is communicated separately from other communications. So what about progress reports? Well, essentially, of course, yes, you can use progress reports, but importantly, not for certifications and not for notifications. So, for example, you couldn't as a contractor rely on a compensation event notification or an early warning notification, which is given in a progress report that must be issued separately. Emails with three separate PDF attachments, I am still going to say no on that. So an early warning, a CE notification and a revised programme. Essentially for me, it's as if that has never been sent at all. So take care with this clause 13.7. I have to say that whether I was a contractor or an employer, I would be tempted to delete this clause entirely. I think it works brilliantly where you've got a project where maybe there's going to be five compensation events or five variations. When you've got a job that might have 50, 100 or 200 variations, I think this clause makes the contract become very unwieldy. OK, top tip number four is specifically about clause 61.3. And actually, I do wonder whether this is the import, most important clause in the contract. The clause, as I've quoted here, is the original clause in the contract, and it is worth reading out. It says the contractor notifies the project manager of an event which has happened or which is expected to happen as a compensation event if the contractor believes the event is a compensation event and the project manager hasn't notified it. So here we are, but straight away we're talking about an official formal notification of a CE. It continues, if the contractor does not notify a compensation event within eight weeks of becoming aware that the event has happened, the prices, completion date or a key date are not changed unless the event arises from the project manager or the supervisor giving an instruction or a notification, issuing a certificate or changing an earlier decision. Importantly, therefore, this is what's called a condition precedent clause. If the contractor fails to give a notice of a compensation event, unless it comes within the last two lines, the contractor will lose its rights to gain time and money and also could become exposed to liquidated or delay damages. Importantly, also watch out for amendments to this clause. Again, this is the same advice I would give under NEC3 as under NEC4. I regularly see the eight week notification period being changed. Uh, I have put my witch's head on on this example and changed it to two weeks, which again is going to cause huge problems down the line between a contractor and a subcontractor. And I've gone further. I've also deleted the last couple of lines there as well, meaning that the contractor has to notify everything. So take care, not just on the original clause in the NEC3, NEC4, but also the amendments that can be made to it as well. Top tip five on the programme key dates and uh, liquidated or delay damages. This is a huge, enormous area and I'm just going to pick out two. And really because I do see many, many issues occurring in relation to this issue. Key dates, first of all, too often uh, people I work with, subcontractors, main contractors and clients don't understand the importance of key dates. Um, defined in 11.211, essentially a date by which work is to meet a condition stated in the contract. 
It's quite often used for directly employed contractors. So there's an existing main contractor and the employer wants to have some work done directly. Um, or it affects an agreed third party contractor that's coming onto the site. Uh, my normal examples that I give here would be ADT and or Chubb coming in to do some security wiring to match in with the employer or the client's existing wiring on a project. This is what I'm going to call an unliquidated damages situation. If the contractor fails to meet the key date and the client then incurs additional cost, the contractor has to pay the additional cost incurred. It isn't a liquidated or pre-agreed amount, it's whatever it costs the client. And so that's why I want particular attention to be paid to that item. OK, moving on to again, I slip into the old terminology of liquidated damages, but of course it should be called delay damages. Um, I've quoted there for you the extract from contract data part one. At the top there you can see we're quoting delay damages where we've only got one completion date. Note that it's stated per day. If you mix X7 and X5 together where there is sectional completion, obviously you can also have delay damages per section as well. Clients and contractors alike need to pay attention to that to make sure the sectional completion is sensible and it works and actually how it fits in with the whole job as well. You can see at the bottom of that particular extract, there's a section for delay damages for the rest of the job as well. So that needs care when it's being filled in. I've also within the notes quoted the full extract of X7. So again, X7.1 says it's delay damages per day and it runs until the earlier of the three stated dates. Completion, takeover or the termination certificate. The only other clause I want to refer to here is X7.3 and that allows a pro rataing of delay damages if there is an early takeover. Now importantly it is not done on the basis of the value of the works. It's done as a proportion of the benefit to the client and in a selfish way uh, I can see that there is a huge cause there for a dispute between the parties because how on earth are you going to value the proportion of the benefit? I was giving a similar seminar to this yesterday and I gave an example of a new train station, obviously HS2 uh, being at the forefront of my mind, a new train station with a number of shops that were going to be situated on the concourse. The contractor has managed to get the works in relation to the train station and the platform completed, but actually the works to the shops have not been completed on time. How on earth would you proportion that particular item? I think it would be a good idea again for both parties to think about this at the time that the contract is let and perhaps think about it as sectional completion if that is a distinct possibility. Um, last slide on this particular section. Remember delay damages, liquidated damages, they do essentially mean the same thing. Uh, probably this is the fourth time I've said this. It's per day and not per week. Um, a contract I was checking yesterday, uh, I think it was £1,700 per day, which actually sounds a relatively small amount of money. Um, but when you're thinking that that's more like £12,000 a week, actually, I always think converting it back to a weekly rate gives you a bit more idea of proportionality. Um, if the liquidated damages or delay damages is repaid, interest is also paid. Final point, if X7 isn't chosen, the contractor is then exposed to general or unliquidated damages. 
So my advice to contractors is that they should always make sure X7 is chosen, but at the smallest possible amount, even a pound per day or a pound per week. What I really need at this point is some organ music, kind of Phantom of the Opera, scary music, because the next tip I'm looking at are Z clauses. Um, Z clauses again are an option. For me, they are just far too popular. They're incorporated by contract data along with the W's, the X's and the Y's, and they do have the same status as other clauses. And often, quite simply, they're just not needed or just wrong. They refer, for example, to provisions which should be part of the scope, or they should deal with compliance with the law, which of course CDM clauses. Importantly, they can change the whole risk profile of the contract. Now, NEC does recognise that this is a problem. And back in October 2014, to great fanfare, they issued this statement. In a bid to continually improve industry standards, NEC has this month started a campaign to reduce the misuse of Z clauses in NEC contracts with a view to increasing understanding of the clauses by all users worldwide. A brilliant statement of intent, but I have to admit that since 2014, I have only seen an increase in Z clauses and certainly not a decrease. So, OK, um, a, there is a good thought there, but unfortunately, Z clauses remain too popular. Um, interestingly, on a call I was on just before giving this seminar, um, both myself and the contractor I was advising had both come across a um, contract by uh, a, an, a water company who will remain nameless at this point, who had 141 pages of amendments to their NEC contract, which entirely goes against the ethos of the contract. Yes, I can see that some might well be necessary, but 141 pages? Is that really contracting under NEC 3 or NEC 4? I sincerely suggest not. Um, I will also talk at this point about the trickle down effect. The more changes that the client makes in the main contract, then of course, what's the main contractor going to do? Trickle those changes down the line to the subcontractors. And I would also suggest probably add in a few more as well. Again, we looked at the eight week time period under 61.3. If that was changed to two weeks, are we really thinking it's realistic for a subcontractor only to have one week to notify? And this really, I think, is where the unfairness can come out. So take care with Z clauses. I will describe them in certain instances as a necessarily necessary evil. Um, I could also describe them as um, lawyer's paradise as well for the number I see written. I promised you I would also mention the issue of design. And for me, this clearly shows how actually the contract is not a fair contract and is not a partnering contract in any way, shape or form. And I'm talking there whether it's an unamended or an amended contract. If we look at uh, section two of the NEC contract, this confirms that the contractor has to provide the works in accordance with the works information under NEC 3 or of course in accordance with the scope under NEC 4. When we're talking about design responsibility, design responsibility tends to fall into one of two sections. Either the contractor has to use reasonable skill and care, which matches the level of design responsibility of consultants, or it's a fit for purpose or guarantee. Unfortunately, the basic NEC contract is a fit for purpose obligation in relation to design, unless X15 is chosen, which then brings us back to a 
reasonable skill and care level of liability. If X15 is chosen, actually then the contract does become far more friendly to a contractor because X15 says that the contractor is not liable for a defect which arose from its design unless it failed to carry out that design using the skill and care normally used by professionals designing works similar to the works. So in other words, it's now the client's obligation to prove that the contractor failed in their duty rather than as we had under NEC3, it was a contractor's responsibility to actually prove that they had used reasonable skill and care. So X15, do you remember before it was on my red list for contractors that they should make sure that that option is chosen. The next section I want to look at is contract data. Now my notes here do refer to contract data part two, but it's equally relevant to contract data part one. So I think going forward, if I do give this session again, this will just say contract data. And the issue I have here, I, I suppose partly to blame NEC3 and NEC4 and the drafters of the contracts, but also to, to blame the users is that if you look at the contract, there generally isn't enough space to fill out the boxes with the, what you want to actually bespoke the contract with. And so I find that clients and contractors alike retype these documents. Again, if I am doing a contract review, I will actually take the base printed NEC document and check it against the typed version because unfortunately people do by mistake, if I'm being kind or deliberately, if I'm being more realistic, they miss bits out or retype it to suit their own agenda. So my top tip here is particularly at tender stage, do check the version um, against, in, sorry, the version that you're working on against the base or the original printed NEC document. Provisional sums. And um, well, we are approaching the pantomime season and uh, we are middle of November and I am seeing Christmas trees going up, but I will emphasize not in my house until after the 20th of December. And why am I saying the pantomime season is amongst us at this point? Well, for provisional sums, quite simply, oh no, you can't under NEC. NEC itself does not refer to provisional sums. NEC works from a brilliant starting point. It works on the basis that all the work should be designed before work starts on site. And quite simply that if works cannot be clearly defined, then they should not be included in the contract. The NEC takes the approach that if, if work is instructed afterwards, it should then be followed by the normal compensation event procedure. And if you include a provisional sum without having alterations to the clauses, there will be trouble ahead because who is taking the risk on the level of the provisional sum that has been included? So my advice in this particular area is very straightforward. Provisional sums should not be included under, in the NEC contract unless you have got a set of contract amendments to suit. We are quickly approaching the end of this seminar and I have two top tips to go. Bear with me. The first one is all about the defects date and the defects correction date. And quite simply, I put this in because I still think there's a misunderstanding in the industry in relation to this particular area. Um, for ease, I've quoted from contract data part one here. Contract data part one says um, that the period between completion of the whole of the works and the defects date is, and I'm normally expecting to see there either one year, 52 weeks or maybe 104 weeks. That's what I used to refer to as the defects liability period. So in other words, for what kind of period is the contractor 
obliged, sorry, is the client obliged to knock on the door of the contractor and say, Oi, I've got a defect. I'm giving you the right of first refusal to put this particular defect right. The defects correction period under the NEC is how long the contractor has to put a particular defect right. If I think about, um, I, do, I do quite a bit of work in the housing association area. Um, and what we find there is that particularly for tenants who are living in housing association properties, if the boiler stops working, the housing association need a very quick turnaround. And we see that the defects correction period for M&E related defects could be as short as four hours. In relation to emerge, other emergencies, it could be 24 hours and the general period is 48 hours. And I think that the NEC really have confused this themselves by changing the terminology. So the defects date is normally completion to the period for which you are then liable for defects in terms of the client having to knock on your door first. And the defects correction period is how long you've got to put right a particular defect that has arisen. The final one is all about early warnings. And essentially what we're looking at in relation to early warnings is the issue of risks or as it's been renamed now, or liabilities. Remember that the only way the contractor is entitled to additional time or additional money is through the compensation event procedure. If it's not a compensation event, it's a contractor's risk. If it is a compensation event, then it's a client risk or a client liability. The compensation events are listed, of course, in section six or clause 60. That section also refers to clause 80.1. And of course, added to that list are the risks which are identified in contract data part one as a client risk or a client liability. I've quoted on the slide there again an extract from contract data part one, and you can see there the additional client liabilities that are completed. So this could be, for example, the risk of the river at the bottom of the site flooding that could be a client liability. On the next slide, it does also say in contract data part one, it says the following matters are included in the early warning register. OK, just because items are listed here, importantly, this is not an allocation of risk. Contract data part two has exactly the same top part of that box. This is importantly, I'll say it again, it is not an allocation of risk. It's simply saying this is a problem and it might happen. And the only way that the contractor is entitled to extra time or extra money is through the compensation event procedure. This bit, the early warning register, is not an allocation of risk. And I think I'm just a couple of minutes over my aim to finish by about 10 to. So it is with a little bit of nervousness that I can say to you all that actually you do now have the opportunity to ask questions. I will say that I am brilliantly relieved and um, that nobody typed any questions into the chat as far as I can see. So few at that point, um, but I am going to be here for a few more minutes. Um, Nervously, I ask um, if you want to type into the chat, you can or because it's a relatively small group. If somebody wants to unmute and ask a question, uh, be my guest. Um, I'm just going to ask for easy questions, though. Um, does anyone have any burning questions? It could be related to the presentation. I will take questions more widely, generally in relation to contract issues, um, as long as they're on a commercial basis. Uh, Philip, you have a question for me. Yes, it's a very simple one, and perhaps it's uh, my naivety on contracts. Well, what's the difference in choice between the NEC3 and the NEC4? 
Uh, oh, oh gosh, right. So I, I would start with the communications side. That that would be really the main reason that people would go for any C4 um, rather than any C3 is because it's been updated really on the use of emails. That would be the prime issue. Um, NEC 4, when it was brought out, they did actually have a brilliant catchphrase and they said it was evolution, not revolution. So I possibly could say it's a bit like going from an iPhone 11 to an iPhone 13. For the vast majority of people, it'll kind of work in the same way, but the quality of the pictures that you take will be better and the battery life apparently is also a bit better. So the communication side I think is a good one between NEC 3 and NEC 4. Um, I think the other important one that's coming to my mind at this point is also the uh, NEC drafting committee have recognised that project managers um, quite often don't actually approve updated programmes and they've put in place what's called a default procedure. Now, for me, that's a great idea. If the project manager doesn't respond to an updated programme, the programme is then deemed to be accepted. Brilliant, OK? However, what do I think that clients and project managers are doing with that deemed acceptance procedure? They are zedding the clauses out. So NEC has started from a, a position of, I'm going to say good morality on that, uh, but actually the good work is probably undone in many instances. Um, uh, my feeling is that actually it has taken an awful lot of time for people to move on to NEC4. I mean, essentially it's four years old now. Um, I have been given advice on NEC4 probably over the last two years, but the bulk of the work is still on NEC3. Uh, and that's because of frameworks. Frameworks which specified NEC3 have had to keep with NEC3. But of course, now we're seeing frameworks being updated and generally they're done on an NEC4 basis. So it's taken time. Um, I'm not ready to mothball my NEC3 notes at all. I'm still lecturing, thank goodness, on NEC3, but NEC4 is, we're mo I'd say in two years time, I'd say NEC3 will be rarer in terms of an upfront work from me. Okay, uh, great question. Thank you, Philip, and thank God I was able to answer it. Um, very much, nicely answered. Good stuff, thank you, Philip. Uh, it, looks, it looks like you've been very lucky, Geraldine, in terms of, um, of questions. I, I, I've put that down to it being an excellent presentation oh, thank um, you. And, and certainly um, something that you've demonstrated your expertise and knowledge of the NEC contracts as, as you did with NEC3 previously. So from that perspective, thank you very much. I think um, people will gladly take away the um, the slides that we'll, we'll publish on our website and I think um, that will certainly reinforce some of the very key points that you've identified. So from that, well done. Um, thank you. From my perspective, perhaps I may even uh, consider quantity surveying to be a little bit more than bean counting, <laughs> um, but I won't tell everybody that. So, um, yeah, very, very impressed. Thank you. Thank you very much. So if there is no more um, presentation uh, questions, obviously Geraldine just put her contact details up there. So she's generally happy to take questions remotely, which is very, very kind of her. Um, if there's no more questions, then um, I'd like to say thank you very much and uh, hopefully we'll we'll invite you along to another presentation maybe next year. Brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, Martin and the rest of the team at SIBSI. Uh, thanks very much and delighted to uh, give this presentation. Uh, enjoy your lunch, everybody. So just just before we, we, we conclude, um, just one final point is our next CPD presentation takes place on the 24th of November. Um, slightly different subject, uh, BISA TR50, which is about the good practice guide for supports and fixings. So a totally different subject matter. Uh, so I suspect maybe some of the uh, people here today may not be in attendance, but thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.